Hello, 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 and welcome to Property Game Changers live on the Property Game Changers Facebook page. Each week, you're joining us in conversation with people who have changed the game in property. We're celebrating the power of ethical property investing to really change lives. We're debunking the myth that you necessarily need a lot of money to get started in property. And we're inspiring each other, as always, to believe bigger, to be bolder, and to be game changers for good. And our property game changer this week is special agent and multi-talented Rupal Patel. Rupal used to work for the CIA and served multiple tours, including in Afghanistan. She's a self-proclaimed nerdy badass, and I love anyone who calls himself <laughs> a badass of any description, especially a nerdy badass. Yeah. Um, she is a book devourer, a lifelong learner, and she's always working on becoming mentally and physically tougher. And I, I just, I love that concept as well. And that's what, uh, that's what we're all doing. If we're progressing, we're growing, we're moving forward. She's an international speaker, and she thrives on helping women to women leaders to find their unique voice and to really project their presence with power. And RuPaul is writing a book, which I cannot wait for, which is called From CIA to CEO, What Being in Espionage Taught Me About Life, Leadership and Entrepreneurship, which is a fantastic title. And I've seen her writing and I cannot wait for the book. <laughs> And I first came across RuPaul on Richard Brand's The Property Voice podcast, which I absolutely love to bits. The Property Voice podcast has been around for over five years. And Richard is just such a fantastic guy. And he started yeah. a podcast when he was starting out in property. Well, he actually was a little bit established at that time. But since then, he's really grown massively and gone on to multi-million pound, simultaneous multi-million pound deals. So it's been fascinating listening along. And your episodes, Rupal, where you were on, on Richard's show, I loved your get up and go and your feistiness <laughs> and your drive <laughs> and your yeah. energy and uh, your excitement about property. So welcome to Property Game Changers, Property Game Thank Changers, you. Rupal Patel. Thank you so much. Wow, that's uh, that's quite an intro, and and I appreciate your enthusiasm and your invitation to have me here. So it's uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat. Well, me too. I I just love having seeing people with that energy, that vision, that drive, and you've always had that because you got into the career you were in because you were driven, and that same drive has seen you really not be content in property, uh, to keep yeah. moving forward. The one thing that I really remember from listening to you on Richard's podcast was that you got bored with doing yes. HMOs and yeah. other things and you had to keep moving on and moving on and moving on. And I, I really look forward to um, delving into that with you. But before we delve into all of that juicy goodness, tell us, uh, Rupal, a bit about yourself. Gosh, that's a big question. Um, so myself, yeah, I mean, I think, do you know, I guess to put some, a bit of a, of, a, of a frame around my background and my experience and all of these things, I think the one consistent theme that I can draw from all of my varied experiences, so from working at the CIA to going to business school, to starting in property, to becoming a leadership coach and mentor, the consistent theme has always been around becoming an expert in something, getting really immersed in something, trying as hard as possible to, to learn everything I possibly can, and then helping other people by using that expertise. And so I think that is, up, you know, as, I, as you said in my intro, I am a bit of a nerd. Um, I love to learn. I love I, I love reading. I've always loved pushing myself and trying to understand how to do new things or challenging myself to do things that I previously thought were impossible. Um, and so it's taken me down lots of different paths, but there's always been this element of learning, of expansion, of growth and excellence, and then using anything and everything that I've picked up along the way to help other people with their decision making, with their own journey through entrepreneurship or property or um, foreign policy. So that that's sort of, you know, I think 
it seems like I've taken a, um, um, a slightly non-traditional path, but there is this theme to it uh, that has, yeah, just been consistently with me since I can remember. Yeah, well, just listening to you, and 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 obviously, I've been stalking you online. <laughs> Excellence is really up there with what with what you um, achieve. I was going to say strive for, but is it is what you what you're actually uh, achieving as well. And I know um, that you're just expecting when we arrange this, we weren't sure whether it would go ahead because yeah. you're expecting. Um, baby number two number two yes yeah yeah it's um it's one of those things that you know I never really thought about parenthood um very much and uh anyway long story short we are having uh having our second child um and what's so interesting about a lot of the work that I do now as you know as a coach and as a mentor um is talking to other women and you know this this idea around, oh, well, I have to take a back seat or I have to, um, you know, sort of mute my ambitions or or in some way try to sort of accommodate or not even accommodate to sort of just downplay what's important to me um, as an individual has to has to go out the window. And I think what's been really lovely about having our first daughter and then now being second with our, pregnant with our second child um, is that it can be anything you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And that is a message I don't think women in particular hear enough is this idea around you can continue to succeed, you can continue to, to push, to thrive, to be an individual at the same time as being a great parent. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that you sort of, um, you know, I had that chat offline before we, we got started, but it's, um, yeah, it's it's just something that adds to as opposed to takes away from um, has been my experience. Yeah, and it's 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 a wonderful thing to be able to share with your your family, with your two. Yeah. Um, well, we don't know. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Neither <laughs> do I. <laughs> I, I. You don't know what no. new you new, but with your two children, um, yeah. you know about you know being in business and all of the things yeah. that you do, and they can be involved with you know with mummy uh, um, in her business, and uh, yeah. I, I think that's that's something special. And um, we're just in the process of setting up our SAS, a pension. Mm -hmm. And that's something uh, my son, Alex, is grown up and say uh, is an adult. <laughs> um, and he, But he'll be able to be part of that. And if we had younger mm -hmm. children, um, we could, you know, get them involved up and to uh, they, they, you know, transfer on. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's it's super important to be able to uh, share that with 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 family. And so I just okay. wanted to draw that in because people may not yeah. take that in that um, you're so you're so ambitious and driven, and also have a family, and you're just yeah. uh, about to it's just about to have your second child, and it is an inspiration for people and might oh. give people a different way of thinking about yeah um, I, I think so I think again it's you know that has been my approach is to try to make it what I want it to be and so you know some of it it's not easy um, and it requires a lot of support or it requires having some difficult conversations and awkward conversations sometimes with loved ones or, or partners um, but at the end of the day this idea that you have to let go of who you are and sacrifice your entire life for you know, when you become a parent or when you become an investor or when you get married or whatever all of these stories I think are just you know they're, they're not they're not true. And I think for me, what's been really important is to either find role models to prove to me that, you know, different ways of doing things are possible, or in the absence of having, being able to find one to then sort of prove it to myself, you know, to be the person that I am looking for um, mm -hmm. inspiration from, because it's not always going to be possible to find someone who, you know, mm -hmm. looks like you has similar drive or, you know, similar family background or whatever else it is. Um, and sometimes it's up to us to be the role models that, that we need in our lives. That is a wonderful phrase. Sometimes it's <laughs> up to us to be the role models we need in our lives. And you certainly are a role model. Jane is just commenting here. I met Rupa last year at, Br at a Brighton Pin, awesome speaker. Ah. So inspiring, sharing your property problems that you solved. Thank you so much. 
and uh thank you jane i i i yeah. i know of jane also um so let's go back to you and let's take it back to well first of all i'm interested in um when you were growing up was it yeah. always meant to be i mean it's hard to get into the cia was yeah. that always meant to be did you always know that was the route <sighs> No, actually. Um, I think, again, getting back to this idea of excellence, I think the one consistent theme that was expected of not just me, but of my siblings oh. was that very um, immigrant family, um, an Indian immigrant family story where education was put on you know, was was seen as a premium. So at a bare minimum, my siblings and I were expected to go not just to uni, but to go to the top unis and then to become professionals in some capacity. So that was the sort of the baseline expectation. Um, both of my parents are doctors. So of course the expectation was that we would all follow in their footsteps, but I was always, I don't want to say black sheep of the family because that's a bit dramatic, but I was the one who, who just, who didn't have that, that like, I know I need to do X. You know, I always wanted to explore different things and I have a very strong creative streak as well. So for a while um, I studied fashion design at the Fashion mm -hmm. Institute of Technology and I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer. And then I went to uni and I got into a really, you know, I got into an Ivy League school and my mom was like, well, maybe just make fashion design your side hobby and, and you know, pursue <laughs> academic excellence in a, in a way. Anyway, so, you know, it was sort of, the expectation was there for achievement, um, but not, and and if, you know, my mom had had it her way to also to be a physician, but there wasn't ever really this very strong career pull that I felt. But I always felt was again this interest to explore, to learn, to to travel, to understand how things work, to push myself in different in different ways, and. As an undergraduate, I studied political science because I just found it absolutely fascinating to study how not just the US political system works, but also how international relations um, are sort of orchestrated. And then that uh, lent itself to me going into to study a further degree um, and and study international affairs. And it was through that path that it started to become clear that actually I'm really interested in diplomacy and foreign affairs and international relations. And while I was um, studying, I, I, I interned at um, one of our embassies overseas uh, in, in the Middle East. And I just thought, God, this is the life, you know, learning new, about new cultures, understanding about different people and countries and, and having that involvement in policy making and in um, you know some some high level decisions, it was something that really really appealed to the nerdy side, you know, so the less creative side, but the nerdy side that really likes to be an analytical and and understand and delve into the detail. Um, and so it was then when I was when I finished my master's that I was recruited by the agency, um, and it just seemed like an opportunity of a lifetime where I was like, well, how do you say no to this? Right. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it was a painful process to get in. That is for sure. <laughs> you, you know, there's a lot of vetting and a lot of, um, yeah, it just, it, it took over, I think a year, almost exactly a year for them to do all of my clearance and background checks, et cetera. But it was, as I said, the opportunity of a lifetime. And I was like, I'd be crazy if I, you know, didn't wait for it. Yeah, and then you get to you get to appear on podcasts and be <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we we want to go from there. Obviously, um, what made you leave that career, which you obviously loved so much, and go yeah. full time? Initially, it was full time into property. Yeah, so I did. Uh, you know, there came a point in my career where I just thought I had contributed what I felt was the not the max there's always more you can do but like I just felt like it was time for something new and something different and at the time I had again wanted to live overseas London was always felt like it was a, a city that was calling to me felt like a second natural home I'm a New Yorker so you know London seemed like a, an easy place to be and I just started sort of putting feelers out trying to 
you know, get a sense of what opportunities there would be for me if I moved overseas um, in, and worked in the private sector. So again, long story short, I, I made that transition by doing what I do best and going back to, to school. Um, so I went to London Business School and got my MBA and I just thought, well, this will, you know, help me make that transition from working in the public sector into the private sector. I'll work, um, you know, sort of at a, at a management consultancy or at a big bank or something like that. But while I was studying, I really, it just kept coming back to me again and again and again that I just did not want to work for anybody else ever again. And that I will tie back to sort of my childhood and the expectations because yes, both of my parents were were doctors, but my dad in particular was always very, very keen on emphasizing to all of us, there are four of us, that we should you know, always be financially independent. We should have passive income streams aside from just our day jobs. We should, you know, find smart ways of investing. And ideally, we should be our own boss whenever, you know, if the, the, the possibility arose. So that seed had been planted for, you know, from a very young age. And it was at that time when I was at business school and I just thought, you know what, I think I think he's right. Like, I think I'm done working for other people. And I was, you know, I was 30. I, think I was 31 at the time and I just thought well let me give this a go and so that process of that two-year MBA really helped me suss out what am I interested in what are the opportunities out there what can I really start sinking my teeth into and learning about and becoming an expert about um, to on this road to being my own boss and actually it was property that sort of came to the to the fore um, and so my partner and I and who's now my husband um, we decided that you know once once I graduated I would use all of my time to to basically start and grow our, our property business mm. that, that that's that's a, that's a lovely story there's a lot of um, <laughs> parallels another property game changer that I had on Aisha Afori, who used to work oh, at yeah. Aisha is another alumna from uh, London Business School. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So she went through that process and, and yeah. eventually, obviously, has left and gone into, yeah. in, into property as well. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I love – people say to me sometimes uh, – Rupal, why do I do why do I do the property game changers? And I just do it because I love it. I'm just fascinated <laughs> by yeah. speaking to people who are doing exciting things and who are driven yeah. and who are ambitious and who are who are keen to grow and keen to give. And so let's move on with your story. Um yeah. so you 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 decide, yeah, you're going into property, um, you're going to leave your beloved uh CIA. <laughs> and, um what what happened next well it was culture shock doesn't even begin to explain sort of that transition from always being in a structured environment of some kind to all of a sudden having endless days in front of you where you don't know what you're doing because you've never done it before you don't know necessarily how to do it <laughs> and there's this for some people of, of whom I would include myself, that lack of structure is both liberating but also really terrifying because all of a sudden it's like you wake up every day and you're like, there are a million things I could be doing, which is the right one? And so it took a lot of trial and error to to come up with a sort of a, a structure that worked for us and worked for, for me um, because, you know, in the beginning, I was the one basically sort of growing our business full time. And the very sort of the nitty gritty of it was, again, this going back to this idea of learning and trying to absorb expertise from others. It, I would say I spent probably, gosh, at least, you know, six months, if not close to a year, maybe even more, just in input mode. So talking to other investors, learning about various property investing strategies, you know, going to, to networking events and listening to speakers and and trying to connect with folks, you know, afterwards to to basically just digest and to get as much information from those who had already done it as I possibly could. And I think, you know, it was it was really great because one of the things that that experience taught me 
is that more often than not, people can be so incredibly generous with their expertise, with their time, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and you just have to ask. And it's, and yes, yeah, of course, not everyone's going to sort of, you know, be willing to, to share because there are some people who in any industry feel very protective and feel like, oh, they're giving away, you know, sort of their business secrets or whatever. But almost without exception, I found people were incredibly happy to share, to show us around, to show us the ropes, to even just point us in the direction of a book or a course or a, a, a webinar or whatever that would be really helpful. And so it was like, again, going into learning mode about property and the specifics of how it worked. And then it was really just a question of taking the plunge. And our first our first investment was a really non-sexy uh, sort of two bedroom Victorian terrace that we were terrified when we were buying. And it felt like, I mean, it is property is a big expensive sort of, or it can be uh, an expensive way to, to get started in, in investing. Um, and that was our first purchase. And we just thought, oh my God, what are we doing? How are we going to make this work? Like it just seemed so weighty and looking back, it's, it's almost, it's, it's almost laughably small. <laughs> it's but, so funny, isn't it? We all go through that same pathway and yeah. our brains uh, because somebody super successful like you who's done so many things and your brain has been trained in a particular way working in you know even to get to the CIA and then working mm -hmm. in the CIA for so many years and then coming out the other side and it's so refreshing in a way to hear that even you when you're buying your first investment property you think yeah. oh my god what are we gonna do it's, it's... I think I think that's what, the other thing that I've sort of learned with um, with time is that everybody, no matter how sort of successful or famous or whatever they become, everybody goes through that process of doubt and of frustration and of anxiety yeah. when doing something, especially when doing something new, because it is scary to do something new. And that is just the human experience. It's yeah. not, you know, unique to one individual. It's just how, yeah. that's just the reality. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but it, uh, thanks for sharing that. And tell us about your first year. Where was it? Was it near <laughs> where you are or is it far away? I actually. No, it was it's, it was close to word um, based just outside of Reading. Our first property was in East Reading. Um, and it was, like I said, a very basic sort of two bedroom Victorian mid terrace. Uh, we did the refurbishment on it ourselves. So again, this idea of learning and immersing yourself in all of getting your hands dirty. Um, you know, we at the time were like, well, we can't really afford to pay the specialists to do this refurb. So anything that doesn't require, you know, gas or electricity, we will do ourselves. Um, and we spent probably, we got it in April to July, so it was about four months just killing ourselves, <laughs> steaming <laughs> off endless layers of wallpaper, of plastering walls, of Googling and YouTubing our way to how to mix plaster, to how do you fill a crack, to all of oh these God. things. I mean, it was just tr definitely trial by fire. And, yeah. you know, I joke about it now, but it took us four months to do a reverb that any qualified builder would have been able to do in two weeks. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just crazy. But, you know, I was actually talking to somebody about this today. I think the great thing about having gotten our hands dirty in that way is that it made us that much more able to assess yeah. when we did hire professionals. Yeah. Okay, yes, we don't know all of the detail, but it's like, yeah, you get you get to a feel for like, okay, well, they, yeah. they know what they're doing or they don't. Um, yeah. And you can sort of have more intelligent conversations with them about mm -hmm. the work required, which I think was really helpful, actually, and especially as a woman and, and still a very male dominated yeah. sort of industry, um, mm -hmm. you know, n knowing what you're talking about can go a long way into basically mm -hmm. not getting ripped off, you know, yeah. And, yeah. And, and being treated as an equal on a site. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, people ask me, um, you know, do people um, underestimate you? Uh, I well, uh, and I say yes, they do <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> before they know me. Well, before I work you open my, your mouth. before be, uh, it's I work with my sister, and mm -hmm. uh, luckily, my sister really knows about the refurbishments. Yeah. I don't know how she knows all that thing, all, all of those things, but she does. But people have to respect her because yeah. 
she really knows her stuff and mm -hmm. um, we are really good together and I know that you when you have that excellence in your mind and when you have that drive and that vision and you you're looking for a certain act come people do respect you even yeah. if they don't at first yeah because it's beyond what they are used to seeing maybe yeah. definitely um, and I think do you know again this is something that's followed me not just as a woman but at various stages of my life and my career because of my age or because of the way I look or other things and you know that is just the world like we all get judged men and women yeah. based on our yeah. initial appearances but yeah. what nobody can ever argue with is expertise and excellence yes. and so yes. you know there's there's a real power in being being prepared and knowing your stuff i mean yeah. when i was a 25 year old briefing senators and and congressional sort of um decision makers like they would look at me and think, oh gosh, well, here comes a child. You know, what can they, <laughs> you could sort of see it on their faces. These are like, you know, men, mostly men, white men in their sort of 50s, 60s, sometimes older. And here I am, this young 20 something woman of color. And yet the second I opened my mouth and I knew yeah. my stuff, yeah. it was a level playing field. And I think that's one of the things that, again, I don't want to sort of make this an overly gendered conversation, but one of the things that, yeah. I think consistently has helped throughout my career, throughout doing lots of different things in very alpha male dominated industries is just knowing your stuff. And as you said, your sister, you know, she's she's an expert and yeah. there's no arguing with expertise. You know, nobody can take that away from you. And so it doesn't mean that we all have to become master builders and, and you know, sort of encyclopedias of, of knowledge of whatever we're doing, um, because there's a danger of sort of you know, feeling like you always have to know more before you can get started. But I think knowing enough and arming yourself with enough information um, to have these intelligent conversations, to, to, to talk at a mostly equal level about certain things, whether it's finance or refurbishment or, you know, whatever it is that comes up in, in property investing, it's, you know, it's, it's worth making that investment. Well, it's actually what you said in one of your uh, your entrepreneur podcasts, where you re you're recapping all of the interviews and what your learnings are. Yeah, be around the right people, yeah. and you won't at the beginning know all of these things. No. because some of them you learn <laughs> from your mistakes. <laughs> but yeah. you've got those experts around you. You can say, "Look, yes. my builders." I'm in this situation with my builder and they're saying this, is this a normal scenario or whatever, but it's just what you exactly said. Surround yourself with the right people so yeah. that you can, you know, know uh, yeah. more than you do. Yeah. Yeah. And leverage their expertise because again, there's a limit to how much any one person can be an expert at. And so again, know enough to have intelligent conversations to feel comfortable in that room in that conversation. But as exactly that, you know, sort of have download and have access to the expertise of others who are specialists in specific things. Um, because it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you need to have, some people call it a power team, some people call it a dream team, whatever you want to name, you want to give it. Like, it's it's really important to have smart people around you because nobody's going to be smart at every single thing. Yeah, exactly. And let's go back, let's go back to you because whenever, whenever I speak to people uh, like you, uh, there's always a million one things I want to ask you at the same time. Time. Yeah. but let's just go you did that first deal you were absolutely terrified yeah. um it went it went well uh tell us give us a little overview of that one and then take us to yeah. the journey of how you went to the next step so that one went well ish um and that's the other thing is you know everyone thinks like oh property is this big sexy thing where you just go from one amazing deal to another to another to another and I will, I can only speak for ourselves, but yes, there is money to be made, but it's not as straightforward or as easy as some might want you to believe when they're selling the dream and selling the sex, right? So that's just something I want to put out there. So this first deal, it was good. It wasn't amazing. It was good. Like I said, we did the refurb. We we had really great tenants who stayed with us. Our first set of tenants stayed with us for about four years, um, oh which is pretty pretty great um but we had had it partly managed and then 
there were a couple of big refurb sort of issues that came up in that, I think I'm going to say the second or third year where, you know, initially, for example, we didn't replace the boiler and then basically it sort of ran out of puff and we had to replace a boiler. So that's, you know, two to three grand just out the door. And basically what, the, you know, sort of over the course of owning that property, what ended up happening is that it always washed its face. It always made a bit of a profit, but it was never anything life changing. It was like between two and 400 pounds a month. So something but not life-changing amounts of money and then what would happen with some regularity is that either a big thing like a boiler would need replacing so there goes your profit for the year or um we would just do cosmetic things to the property to sort of you know make sure that it was always kept up in really good repair and so we ended up selling it in I want to say 2018. Um, so we'd held it for about five or for six years. And in those six years, as I said, it covered its expenses. It's what it washed its own face as the saying goes. Yeah. But the real beauty of owning it was that it kept going up in value. And so we refinanced twice during our owning it um, and pulled out more than what we had put in to begin with. Wow. And then when we sold it, we made an additional 50 K profit on the sale. So so it was a good ish deal, but it wasn't, again, like I said, it wasn't a life changing project that all of a sudden we could sort of retire from. And so, you know, that was sort of our first one. And we had that ticking, ticking along in the background. And then, you know, we did another, I want to say one more single let after that, a slightly bigger one. So now a three bed, um, again, total back to brick gut refurbishment. In this instance, we hired a contractor instead of trying to do it ourselves. Um, and, 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 you know, sort of in going through that experience of doing a bigger refurb project, we just thought, well, actually, you know what, let's, let's try to do something what at the time felt like was going to be a lot more sophisticated. So we're like, ooh, let's look at HMOs. This HMO ooh. thing seems really interesting. Ooh. And so we started with HMOs. Um, we were semi-agnostic about whether we owned them or, or acquired them as rent to rents uh, because for us, cash flow was the biggest target and replacing first my income and then my my partner's income was sort of the our, you know, our immediate goal. And so to serve that sort of cash flow end, we said, OK, well, with HMOs, we've got X amount of funds where we can buy probably two from our own funds. But anything else beyond that, we'll have to either get more investors for or we'll have to start looking at rent to rents. So we did from single lets to HMOs, like I said, a mix of owned HMOs and rent to rents. And then we did then we were ready for for something else, because, again, as you alluded to in the beginning, you know, after you've done a handful of HMOs or we found after we had done a handful of HMOs, I think it was around sort of the 20 tenant mark. We were just like, OK, well, we'll we'll do this for the cash flow, but it's not interesting anymore. You know, if we're going to be doing property for the long haul, we want to still be interested in it, intellectually engaged by what we're doing. And so the next logical step, for, as we saw it, was to go and do conversion projects. So we did two projects where we um, bought big, big, uh, big houses and converted them into fully self-contained flats. Mm. They effectively ended up being new builds because quite mm. literally nothing of the original structure was left except for the front exterior wall. I mean, we literally knew everything and our you know our results were sort of better than new build requirements for you know thermal insulation sound insulation all of that again really nerdy boring detailed stuff mm -hmm. um but that was sort of you know helped us do something you know we did we did things in a slightly more complicated and more complex type of projects and now we're at the stage where we're almost exclusively only doing new build projects um and doing doing full planning applications on off-market sites and that kind of thing where it's a lot more exciting it's a lot more creative um yeah. but it just takes a lot longer to to come to fruition yeah oh that that is exciting so tell us about that project how many self-contained flats was it yeah, so the first one was three flats, um, and it just, it was, like I said, it, it may as well have been new build. We had to do everything that, you know, one has to do. It wasn't like a, a basic 
Mm -hmm. uh, like permitted development uh, right. conversion. We had to go through full planning. We had to do section 106 negotiations. We had to, you know, do all of the building reg stuff, all of the, you know, everything, sound tests, air tests, all, you know, all of these things that seem so esoteric, but were incredibly expensive as well to have to deal yes. with. Um, but the end result was beautiful, you know, and I think that look again, looking back, at the time, it was incredibly painful mm -hmm. um, financially as well as emotionally, and you just think, like, oh. "Oh, have I have I done too much?" And everything is just that much more expensive at a slightly higher scale, um, and so there's a lot more financially at stake as well. But the end product was just is, you know, it is still stunning four years later, um, and I think there's something really gratifying about knowing that it's because of us mm -hmm. that you know, we're reclaiming these homes and providing beautiful places for people to live. Yeah, it is so gratifying. It just makes my, it just, I don't know what to say, you know, when they say, it, I, I can feel it when you're speaking. And yeah. I, I feel that way as well. And was this in Reading? Was Yeah. Reading? So all of our stuff, up, up until 2018, all of our stuff was, in and around Reading, um, Reading itself. I think the one exception is we have an HMO in Bracknell, um, mm. but now our development sites have a slightly wider radius. So we go pretty much within like an hour to two hours drive radius of Reading. So um, we've got currently one site, ironically around the corner actually. <laughs> so that's not too much further afield, but another two in Surrey mm. that um, are in planning at the moment. Brilliant. Uh, well, well, we can talk about those in a moment. But uh, Joelle's saying uh, great content that a lot of investors will be able to relate uh, to. Thank uh, you. Um, so you you're now you've now moved on from your well your your conversion that was almost a, a new build. Yeah. Uh, you're doing these bigger developments. So yeah. um, tell us about some of or oh, you're doing some some new builds. That, yeah. That's all you do now. So yeah. uh, can you tell us a little bit, give us an insight into into that world? Oh, it is, it is a different <laughs> world and it's not one to enter lightly. So again, I think, you know, taking a longer term view, it's, I'm not really sure sort of where, you know, the those who are joining us live or who will listen later, sort of where they're at in their journey. But for us, it was really, really important to do things in a, I hate to say sensible because it sounds so boring, but in a sensible way. So for us, we didn't really start looking at development projects or any of that kind of stuff until we had our cash flow and our yes. expenses totally covered. So our mm -hmm. rental portfolio of HMOs, of single lots, of all of that kind of stuff, you know, we, it took us about five years to, almost exactly actually five years to replace not just my income, but my husband's income. And it was only at that point, I mean, literally only at that point that we allowed ourselves to look at these bigger sites because mm -hmm. development is incredibly sexy, it's incredibly exciting. And it was something that we both wanted to do to, again, have impact at a greater scale, to be able to use more creative um, of, of our creative side and doing the design and the layout and all of that stuff. But it's Inc it can be incredibly risky. And if nothing else, it is very, very, very time consuming. So there is often a long lag between when you identify a site and when it's actually built out and sold and through planning and you've sold all of the units that you've created. I mean, that time scale can be anywhere from two years to 10 years. And you cannot, or our position was, it is far too risky to put so much uh, financial and personal stake on a single site or a handful of sites because it could take a really long time before you see a penny out. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to make sure that we did have all of our expenses, our income covered before we would, you know, sort of make the foray into that world. Um, but then when we did, it was, you know, again, I, I am going to sound really boring and really nerdy, but like it really was just a question of, of developing expertise, a whole new expertise. I mean, development is learning about property in so much more detail than I think a lot of investors are prepared to 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 invest in sort of as far as in their learning. I mean, 
you know, there are, you have to know about the local planning policy. You have to know how the local counselors feel about development, what their specific bugbears are, what their specific pet projects are. You know, some are really hot on electric charging points. Some are really hot on amenity space. Like it's so varied based on not just the council, but on the individual. And so it's, it's, you know, you have to really be willing to study and to learn to make a success of it. And I think, yeah, look, you could sort of, I excuse the language, but half-ass your way through a lot of things in life in general, but I would not suggest doing that with development where the stakes are just that much higher, both professionally and financially, but also for the end product of, you know, what you're creating. And so developing that expertise, it takes time and it takes, you know, again, this commitment to learning, to, to learning from experts, to paying for mentoring from people who have done it, you know, before you or are, you know, far more experienced than you are. I think that's the other thing that people can often be a little bit uh dismissive of is this idea of of paying for mentorship or paying for expertise mm. we have never ever ever skimped on paying for having the right experts at the right time and we have never regretted it people would you know will would sort of we've talked to her like oh my gosh you're paying that much for a consultant or that much for a mentor or you can take a different view on it or one can take a different view but our experience has always been paying for the right education or for the right expertise from the right people it just it it's an investment it's not a cost and it's it's worth making that investment yeah i totally agree and i i i haven't been i i've been a lifelong learner in one sense in that i was always an avid reader even as a girl but i i I would say my targets were set way too low for many, many, many years, if not decades. And so I was striving towards these very low targets. Um, But more recently, within the last five years, since I've become more involved within property, Mm -hmm. um, I I have, you know, invested heavily in in education and mindset and learning how to think uh, to be successful. And I can't believe that I just think my world would have opened so much sooner had I yeah. invested so much sooner, had I realized so much sooner. And so I just absolutely agree with you. But should I tell you what I've just realized that we're coming to yeah. the end? Oh, no. I can't believe <laughs> that we haven't even talked about a lot of the things that I want to talk about. So let's touch uh, on the, let's talk on some of the ones at least. Um, I'll be quick. So no, uh, you 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 um, take you know give the answers um, because yeah. the full answers. So I want to talk to you obviously about women and entrepreneurship because you yeah. have the Entrepreneur Podcast, which I absolutely love what you're doing. Uh, there. Thank you. So I'd love to uh, get some insights from you uh, for women who are uh, thinking about getting in business or who, or who are in business and want to take this yeah. next level. Yeah, I think, gosh, so for me, the reason I created the podcast and created that community is because I just felt like, and again, you and I touched upon this a little bit earlier in our conversation tonight, but this idea of the power of the people around you and the power of community, the power of expertise and the power of just sort of shared baseline goals as far as what we want for our lives or what we're trying to achieve and that kind of thing. And so for me, I think, the reason I created the podcast and and the community was because I think still sad to say in the 21st century, but women have, it's just, we have a different time of it. Mm -hmm. And some of it is social. Some of it is cultural. Some of it is internal. Some of it is external. Mm -hmm. And I was just finding myself getting so frustrated being the only female developer in a room, the Mm -hmm. only female agent in a room, the only woman of color in a room, all of these onlys. And, you know, you sort of it's, it's sad because you you stop recognizing that you are the only or one of a handful yeah. or you know yeah. one of just two because it just becomes your reality but i just thought this is crazy like why why is this the reality and what is going on here because it's not for lack of competence it's not for lack of aspiration it's not for lack of anything there's just a lot of stuff going on and so you know i would rail <laughs> against these statistics and 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 
again, to excuse the language, it's the New Yorker in me, but like bitch and moan to my partner about like, this is crazy. I was the only female speaker. Or I was the only woman of color in the room or da, 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 da. And he's like, well, what are you doing about it? And that sort of question, again, it goes, sort of goes back to this idea of like, if you don't see it, you got to create it for yourself. And that's sort of what, what spurred it was like, I didn't see the type of community that I wanted and I thought that was, there was a need for. So strong, driven, ambitious women who are in various fields, who, you know, are very motivated, very, very sort of capable of achieving various heights, whether in property or in corporate um, settings. And so trying to contribute to making sure they get to that end goal that they want to, that they, you know, become the developer they want, that they become the CEO, that they start the business, that they don't dial back on their dreams and aspirations just because, because of lots of different things. And so it was, it was, it was both a uh, sort of a need that I felt, you know, I wanted to contribute to, to, to sort of filling but it's also something that it was also very selfish in the sense that like you know i know that there are tens hundreds millions probably of women who have this spark and this capability this potential and i wanted to do whatever i could in whatever big or small way i possibly could to help them realize that potential and bring it into the world and I've put up on the screen, uh, but for yeah. people listening, ah, thank the you. podcast, it's uh, entrepreneur.co.uk. Have I spelled that right? That's absolutely perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's E-N-T-R-E, P-R-E-N-O-R-A, yep. <laughs> entrepreneur dot yep. uk but if you google it they'll even correct your spelling so Is that right? well, that's uh, good. <laughs> uk or you can look at rupal rupal patel um yes. and uh you'll find it and uh, jane has commented that this is a fascinating interview and i think you always take action when the time is right for you but i yeah. think sometimes you can be inspired to take action yeah uh, I, I think both I, of those I, are true I was inspired to take action. I was I was thinking about it, but kind of tentative. And then I was inspired to take action. Yeah. So I think that what you're doing with Entrepreneur uh, will help people to be inspired to take the action that they tentatively want to take, but maybe yeah. are not quite bold enough yet. Well, it's that it's it's having not just the inspiration, but like having the specific tactical knowledge of how yeah. do I do the things that I want to do, yeah. and then also having other again role models or sounding boards that they can talk to, who are in similar positions or who might understand some of the nuance of what it's like to be, you know, a woman in property, a woman in in finance, whatever else it is, and to give very specific relevant advice. So it's that combination of that I, that that lovely combination of the mindset, the community, and the practical support with the information and knowledge. Yeah. Oh, Jane says she's definitely going to be going on to the site after this. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ripal, for, for, for doing that. But as we come to a close, I've got to choose yeah. which of my questions to ask you. Oh, but <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about why um, this is called Property Game Changers. Let's talk about why property has been a game changer for you and for uh, your family. Can I? I cannot overstate this. It has literally been life-changing firstly because it's been the pathway for us to be free so we have bought back our time my partner or husband and I now both work exclusively for ourselves and yes it's there are you know sort of some um uh it's not all roses all the time but like that freedom is just it is life-altering you know we've we're, we're able to take time off to spend with our our daughter and and for you know whoever whatever comes next we don't have to worry about oh well do i have enough sick leave or annual leave or you know this that or the other thing to be able to do the things that are personally and professionally fulfilling and so that in and of itself having having been the mechanism through which we've bought back our time like we both are so thankful for just that alone. For me, there's been this additional benefit of 
you know, my husband has property in his blood through and through, and he will be a developer until the day he retires, which will probably be when he's like 95 and too old to hold, you know, sort of stand up straight kind of thing. For me, it's been a sort of a two pronged journey, whereas property has been, again, life changing and, and, you know, giving me back my time and my freedom and all of these things and taught me some really core business skills and, you know, very important life skills. But it's also given me the freedom to explore the other things that I love, like mentorship, like coaching, like helping other women realize their dreams and their ambitions. And for that, I, you know, I property has been absolutely game changing because it's shown me an additional path. So it's not been, you know, it's 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 uncovered something that I knew I wanted to do. I, there was a sense that I always have had of like wanting to have an impact at scale, but I never knew what it, that you know field would be in. And through property and through the mentorship that I started doing, just form informally and then more formally, and the coaching and the all of that kind of stuff that I did for people on property, it's really opened up this whole new world where I'm like, well, actually, I want to take this. I want to take this on a bigger scale. I want to work with women, and I want to work in any industry, and I want to do on a global level. That has been the absolute game changer for me. Yeah. And I just want to encourage people to check you out at entrepreneur.co.uk or Google Rupal Patel. And um, well, don't Google Rupal Patel because who will come up is a very uh, harsh looking Indian actress. Oh, <laughs> so, well, I Googled you, you came up, but maybe oh, I... Oh, well, that's good. Well, maybe you have a better Google, because anytime I Google myself, I'm like, oh, gosh, that's what people see is this really, yeah, really intense, harsh-looking Indian actress. But, hey, if your Google is better than mine, then Rupal Patel should work. <laughs> if you Google Rupal Patel Entrepreneur... Oh, know, that should, yeah. <laughs> if, if entrepreneur.co.uk doesn't work for you, um, you know, Google... But I, I found you everywhere when I when I. Oh, that's good. Oh, okay. Maybe my Google's broken then. <laughs> Maybe your Google already knows you. I, I don't know. But um, <laughs> let's just end by giving some advice to people who perhaps are where you were a few years ago before you had stepped into property when your first deal made you feel very anxious for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. What advice would you would you give to people who are thinking of getting started? Oh, uh, so I would say that one of the biggest pieces of advice that still helps me is focusing on what you can control. I think that is an incredibly hard thing to do because especially in the beginning when the challenges seem like they're coming thick and fast and everything comes with a really big price tag and you're getting let down by this person or having issues with that contractor or this you know builder isn't doing what they're doing supposed to do etc it can be so easy to get wrapped up and totally like just wound up into this ball of like stress and anxiety and all of these other things and that's normal of course but the key is to then park that and focus on the things that you can actually control. So, you know, can you get a new contractor in? Can you change the, the, the contract under which you're operating or working with? Can you, you know, what is it, what actions can you actually take? Because it is so much more gratifying and also just it keeps you going you know because otherwise you'll just get stuck and you'll get angry and you'll get frustrated and all of the things that you can't control will oh, totally overwhelm you um so focus on what you can control is it's one of those i feel like zen master things that we all need to to work on um but it makes a big difference yeah. and then i think the other really big key has a I, you know i keep coming back to it and, and you said it earlier but like is to be in a community that is relevant for where you are so whether it's property or if it's you know specific to rent to rent or whatever it is mm. be around people who are doing it and he who understand what it's like to be doing it because they will be your best advice givers sounding boards sort of cheerleaders, all of the above that you need because they know what it's like and they can, those who have done it 
and are a few steps ahead of you will be able to give advice from experience. Those who are at the same level will be able to sort of be a shoulder for you to lean on if you ever need it. But that combination of moral and practical support is absolutely invaluable. And anytime I have achieved anything that's been important to me, it's been at least in part because I've had great people around me, either as advisors or mentors or whatever, or as part of a community of people who understand what I'm doing. Oh, just such great advice. The first part, I love it, is ask great questions. Yeah. You know, what can I what can I do here that's going to help me to get out of this situation? Yeah, to take back control of the situation. And there's always something, and it doesn't always. feel like that at the beginning. But as you said, especially when you're at the beginning, the answers are simple to someone. <laughs> Even yeah, though they don't yeah. feel simple to you, and yeah. just in case, finding out what those answers are, and as you say, being in community with the right people, and that's yeah. why uh, communities such as Entrepreneur are so important and so yeah. valuable, way beyond the tangible, because yeah. it's the it's it speaks to your unconscious mind and it helps mm -hmm. you take actions you wouldn't otherwise take even though yeah. your conscious mind wouldn't necessarily know to credit it oh that's because <laughs> i'm part of a community if yeah. i wasn't part of a community i wouldn't feel brave enough to do this yeah um, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Ripple, for coming along and for being so honest, so genuine, so open, and so sharing. And Mo has commented, nice one. She's really enjoying your <laughs> Thanks, interview Mo. To, today. And Jane has said another two uh, great role models. So thank you, Jane. Um, I want to thank you for, for joining us. And as we uh, close for, for this evening, uh, Ripple, yeah. Uh, is there anything that you would like to uh, leave leave people with? The final thought is really just literally anything is possible. Literally anything is possible. So whatever feels terrifying or too big or too audacious or too uh, too scary, it is all of those things, but it's also incredibly possible. And if one person can do it, then any person can do it. So don't lose heart. You know, there are practical things like find find role models, find mentors, learn how you can make them possible. But any dream you have for yourself, I know from my own experience and from the, that of those, you know, I, I've spoken to and have gotten to meet in my life, literally anything is possible. You just have to persist. Oh, but that is a great way to end the show. I love the idea of persisting, keeping going. And uh, Ripple, thank you so much for yeah. sharing your story. Joyal is also joining me in thanking you. And I know that anybody Pleasure. watching and listening will also be uh, thanking you. And I want to thank you who are watching and listening today uh, for joining us here. And we will see you again. Um, but for now, it's goodbye from Rapal Patel, Property Game Changer. Bye. And also goodbye from me. I will see you again soon. Bye for now.